I'm Carl. I'm the singer of Earth Crisis. We started in Syracuse, New York originally in 1989 and at first I played bass. Um, things kind of fell apart with that lineup and I restarted the band with myself as the vocalist in 91 and from there we went on to record and and tour and the band concluded in 2001 but we brought it back last year recorded a new album but I think I think the time's come for a new Earth Crisis album um, so for a lot of people this will be I think this will be their first their first um, Earth Crisis disc because a, a pretty considerable amount of time has gone by since we stopped and started back up so this song musically I think is is like the the best elements of destroy the machines and breed the killers mixed together and lyrically the same it's it's the, the best of breed the killers and destroy the machines your last album why do you think people were so averse to well, it even before earth crisis we were in other bands we were in main force patrol or forefront framework so we've been playing hardcore for close to 14 years by the time we came to 2000 2001 and right around that era we wanted to try and experiment musically and do something different to keep it fresh for us and that's what that album was it was an experiment where we blended different styles together and there was you know some melody interwoven in with the the more aggressive approach and I think I think we did it in a tasteful way and I think it was important for a band like Earth Crisis which is a very much a message oriented band to have lyrics that are decipherable that could get played on the radio and what some of the lyrical topics were that we wanted people to learn about were uh, for people here in the states second amendment rights which is uh, the right that every citizen has to own firearms which I think in a crisis are uh, a vital thing to have in order to defend yourself and the people that you care about. So that I think that was kind of a, a daring thing to touch on and it was a song about um, animal rights and genetic engineering, uh, the wars in Kosovo and Bosnia, some of those other type of things that were going on at the time. So some of them were topical. We did a video for that and it was on MTV, it was on MTVX, and that album reached a lot of people. And we toured with we toured with Sepultura and Misfits off that album. So we, we kind of reached outside of hardcore into the metal scene and into even the punk scene, which led to other tours with other different bands out of our genre. So I'll always chalk that album up as a success. But then again, you know, music is like food or art. It's all a matter of taste. What conspiracy do you, you know, feel to be the most, you know, threatening and the most real? Well, I think in Western Europe and in Canada and the U.S. right now, if you've been paying attention over the last 10 years, and if you're old enough to kind of see how things have changed, I think there's definitely a push from the media to portray people who are in favor of Second Amendment rights or the rights of, you know, self-defense through a firearm. I'm sure you have some type of an, of an equivalent up in Canada that's similar to what we have here in the States. There's an attempt made by the media and Hollywood to portray those type of people as um, you know, off-kilter radicals and that's absurd because you can go and you can look at uh, things that the NRA have online, things that they've printed in their magazine that are taken out of local newspapers where there's all these accounts you know, on a, on a weekly, on a monthly, on a yearly basis where people have used weapons to defend themselves against let's say a carjacker or a robber or a woman who you know shot somebody that was trying to break into her apartment to, to harm her but that stuff is very very rarely reported by mainstream news whether it's in you know magazines or newspapers or television or or websites that are affiliated with one of those other types of outlets hardcore from the time I got into it in the mid 80s through my cousin it was pretty much a, a marketplace of ideas and then as I got a little older when I was in my old, you know, when I was further into my teens, there was, 
you know, Shelter or Cro Mags, seeing about Hare Krishna or Agnostic Front, seeing about uh, patriotism, um, you know, Minor Threat and Uniform Choice, Dressing Straight Edge. So it's all different kinds of ideas and all different types of music too, like the Mad Rains with, you know, reggae songs on their albums. And I think that is missing a little bit in hardcore right now, that diversity of thought and that diversity of sound. The importance of straight edge in your life then and now. Um, there was no hardcore scene when I was younger in the in the mid '80s and the early '80s. Here, I'm I'm almost 40, so I've I've been around for a while. I've been doing this for a while. Um, it was pretty much uh, a punk rock scene. So I saw a lot of people who were heavily involved with drugs and alcohol and then they as time went along things kind of deteriorated for them and they got into you know drugs that were more and more destructive and I mean anyone around here can name at least four people that OD'd that came out of that scene and that's that's a terrifying thing to see happen to you know guys that you grew up skateboarding with and having a great time going to shows you know, I love that music and I love the energy of it. And, you know, we kind of charged up our batteries to skate off of that music. But a lot of the things that were, you know, being served up along with it were things that I was completely opposed to. Um, so that that's originally why I gravitated to Straight Edge. And the reason why I've obviously stayed with it is because, you know, I've seen nothing but evidence um, again and again proving the point that I definitely made the right choice. I have, I would say, far more control over my life and over the, the direction, over the decisions that I, I, uh, I choose to make. I can, ma I can make all those with a lot more clarity if I compare my life to someone who is an alcoholic or is a heavy drug user. They, they take, you know, those like trying to trying to escape through problems through substances is just going to make things worse. It's going to make make a small hole into into a huge abyss that's, that seems to swallow people. If you look at things overall and think about how many kids start out drinking and then smoking marijuana, and then it leads to you know crazier party drugs like like cocaine or speed, and then on and on from there down the line. Um, it's not, it's not overblown. It's happening, and it, it's ruining people's lives. And we, we, you know, we can all see it. It's not just people that are into punk rock or hardcore or metal or what have you. I mean, everyone knows someone that has has problems with those types of things. So, you know, I would never give anyone advice, but if you compare and contrast the differences, it's, you know, the choice is clear. Um. There was some kind of controversy between you and your ex-guitarist, Chris Weichmann. Is that something that you'd like to address, clear the air on, or no? Um, there, there was problems, but I think you know all those wounds healed over maybe four or five years ago. The Syracuse scene has been incredibly supportive of Earth Crisis. Um, MAD, they brought us to Europe countless times. And they, at the beginning, they were definitely taking a risk, because at the time, uh, a lot of the things that that were about message-wise were seen as very threatening in Europe. I think the hardcore scene in Europe in the early '90s was very, very PC. I don't think it is so much anymore, but at the time it was. But you know, they they weren't afraid to bring us, and they've been you know, taking us back ever since. So definitely thankful to Mark and and Uda, and David, and uh, Danny. And, and all the bands, I mean, we, we thank everyone on our thanks list, whether it's, you know, Earth Crisis or Freya or Path, I mean, everyone's, everyone's definitely accounted for. Okay. 